Praise God. All right, if you would, open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. What's in Exodus 20? Ten Commandments, that's right. The Ten Commandments. As you guys get there, I'd like you to think about what Jesus said to us. When he talks about the law of God, he speaks in a different way about the law of God than we oftentimes think today, even in Christian culture. What's normative even in Christian experience in terms of how we talk about God's law, I can recount many instances of this kind of conversation, but I can think about times where I've talked to the moderate evangelical or professing Christian, and the question of the Old Testament comes up, or the law of God comes up, and oftentimes it's expressed in this way. Well, that was the God of the Old Testament. Now we have Jesus. And you see, God in the Old Testament was about anger and wrath. He was really a harsh lawgiver. But the God of the New Testament, He gives us Jesus. He gives us Jesus, and God demonstrates in that point that now God is a God of love and grace and mercy. And oftentimes, you even have it put in this sort of way. Tell me if this sounds familiar to you. It almost sounds, as we talk about it, like the Father is just this harsh lawgiver, and Jesus is sort of the love and mercy of God. Almost in a way that it makes God out to be sort of a split personality. Jesus is really the love of God, where the Father is really the wrath and anger of God. And, and what Jesus is doing is He's trying to help the Father out. He's trying to help the Father to be better, really, than He is. In many ways, now obviously, that's, that's a way to, to overstate it in a way, but I think it's consistent in many ways with how we even describe, and oftentimes, in, in, in instances with unbelievers, we talk about the law of God in the Old Testament with an unbeliever, and they might say things like, well, hey, the law of God says this over here. That seems awfully harsh to me. And we often pad it by saying, well, you know, God is about love now. He's not concerned with those things now. So when we look at something like Exodus 20 and we see the Ten Commandments, we need to think about it in the way that Jesus did. And he said what about the law and the prophets? He said they're built upon two great commandments. What's the first one? Loving God, right? So Jesus quotes there the Shema when the guy asks a question about the law. What's the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. They know what that was because it was a Shema. They quoted it in the morning and evening prayers. They would pray that to God. And it wasn't just a statement. It was a a pledge of allegiance. It was a pledge of allegiance. Shema Yisrael, Yahweh Eloheinu, Yahweh Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. First great commandment. Second one is like it. Jesus says, you love your neighbor as you love yourself. And what does Jesus say about the law and the prophets? All the law and the prophets are built upon love for God, love for neighbor. So that does mean that as Christians today, we can look to the law of God and what God says here, and we can begin to ask the question, well, how is this loving God, and how is this loving neighbor? We can think about what that means and its context. And I want to say something before we actually open this text and read it. It won't take long, I promise. It's short. Exodus 2015. I think when we talk today as a church about something like socialism, you might be thinking, well, I came for the Sunday worship. Like I came for the music and Sunday service, talking about socialism in church. I've had enough of that in my Facebook feed and at the Tea Party website and all the other things, you know, or whatever. You might think, why, why a worship service? Well, let me just say, why a worship service? It's because... Love for God, love for neighbor. That's fundamentally it. When we don't obey God's law individually or in a society, we ultimately don't love God or love neighbor. And I think that all Christians, no matter what your position is on the law of God, listen to you, this is important. Whatever your position is on the law of God, we can all agree to something, no matter what. There's unity here, essential unity. God commands us in the new covenant to love God and love neighbor. Amen? Fundamental, essential unity around that. Now, I want to say as a minister of the gospel, I want to say that if somebody says, what does it look like to love God and love neighbor? What's it going to appear to be? What 
does it mean in my life to love God, love my neighbor? And what's it mean in a society and culture to love God, love neighbor? I, of course, would say, well, we have to go to where God laid that down. And that's the law of God. That's what it looks like in a society to love God, love neighbor. So when we go to Exodus 20, in 21st century, modern evangelicalism, sometimes we can walk up to the average evangelical, the average professing Christian, and we could say, what are the Ten Commandments? List them. Some of you right now are squirming in your seats. If I asked you to come up on stage right now and recite all ten, could you do it? Don't be embarrassed. I won't do it. I promise. Okay. I won't do it today. That's next Sunday. Okay. <laughs> but if I asked you to come up right now and I said, okay, recite the Ten Commandments, could you do it? And if you could, praise God. And if you can't, can I ask you this without condemnation, not condemning in any way. If I asked you, could you do it, and you said, no, I can't, can I ask you why? Do you think it's not relevant? Is it something for times past? Is it really some ancient law God's not concerned with anymore? Is it relevant today? Well, let me ask you this question. Is it relevant to you that God commands not to steal? Is that a relevant commandment? How about this one? You should not commit adultery. Relevant today? What do you think? How about this one? You should not lie. Parents, relevant? Right? It's relevant. All these are relevant. How about this? You shall have no other gods before me. Relevant? Relevant. We can go through the list. We can ask the question, is it relevant today? And I'm going to say absolutely. And so let's look at the text together. Again, this won't take very long. Exodus, but I want to say, man, all of Christian economics the biblical worldview, society and culture, all somehow connected to this passage right here. Exodus 20, verse 15. You shall not steal. Thus far as the reading of God's word. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, I want to pray that you please bless today. God, I know that I'm biting off a big chunk today, and I know that, God, there's so much that needs to change in all of us, and I know that none of us have it all together, and I know that, God, all of us are a work in progress, being sanctified. But I also know, Father, we know that you promised to finish what you started in us, that you promised that you, who began a good work in us, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. You, God, are not going to stop until Christ is formed in us. And so, Father, I pray to get me out of the way. God, no matter what disagreements exist amongst Christians in different areas, God, we know that we have fundamental convictions because there is clarity in your word about things. And we have essential unity around those things, God. And I just pray, Lord, in this small little church, that you would do something through this message. That, Lord, would bless the world for the sake of Christ and his gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. So our current political situation, it's a tough one, right? It's a tough one. You have a situation today where... All of us as Christians, we recognize that there are real serious problems going on around us. And you might say, well, like, well we're here for worship. Like, that's like religious. And now we're going to talk about a political situation. I'm going to say that fundamentally actually displays a problem in terms of our thinking about what God is Lord over. Jesus said the greatest commandment, number one, is to love God with heart, soul, and mind and strength. Jesus is supposed to be Lord over our minds. And amidst the different disagreements amongst Christians, no matter where you may be on whatever issue, it doesn't matter. We can have essential unity about the fact that God is the sovereign over everything. Can we agree to that? Amen. God is the sovereign over all things. He is the sovereign. He's in charge. And he here's what we need to know as Christians is that every issue that we can bring up around us that's happening in our society and our culture is somehow connected to a falling short of God. It's somehow connected to not loving God and not loving neighbor. And I want to say that those are essentially gospel issues. So, for example, if we have an issue today around us in American culture and society like rampant theft of the individual, 
I want to say that that's a gospel issue. How is it a gospel issue? It's a gospel issue because first and foremost, if we're willing to take stuff from our neighbor involuntarily that does not belong to us, that is because we have larceny, theft in our hearts. And the only way you're going to stop a society and a culture from taking stuff from another person in an involuntary way, the only way you're going to ever stop it is if you can get, if you can shake that larceny out of people's hearts. People have to not love theft. They have to stop loving theft in order to desire in a culture and society to stop stealing from one another. And I want to say the only way that this problem will be solved in any society is if people's hearts are fundamentally transformed. Think for a moment about what God says in Ezekiel 36 about what we're talking about. Part of what he says he's going to do in regeneration and actually saving people is he does something that we can't do for ourselves. It says that he takes a heart of stone and he turns it into a heart of flesh. There's a heart before that that's hard to God. It will not receive the things of God. It's not soft. It's not malleable. It's actually resistant to God. That's an interesting in Ezekiel 36 that when he talks about how he's going to do this in our lives as believers progressively, no one's there yet. We're all that work in progress. As he says he's going to do it, you know what he says? He says he's not going to do it for us. He's going to do it for his name's sake. He's going to take out a heart of stone and put a heart of flesh there. And then it says he's going to put his spirit within us. And then it says he's actually going to cause us to observe his statutes. So let me just say, I'm going to confess to something. There's a bit about this discussion where our hands are tied. We can't fix it. I can't fix it. You can't fix it. Neither political candidate right now can fix it. No political party can fix it. You're not going to come up with a solution ultimately to this problem that's better than God's. God's way is to take people who are resistant to Him, who don't love Him and don't love neighbor. He takes them from their rebellion and He brings them to a place of reconciliation and peace with Him. And He does something in you and me that we cannot do for ourselves. He causes us to desire to love Him, to love His law, and to love our neighbor. So I'm going to just start the sermon today by saying something that might kind of bother you. And that's this. Ultimately, I don't have a solution for you except God. There, there is no solution. You can do nothing ultimately to fix this problem in culture and society. It can only be God. So that's the beginning of the sermon. Ready? Hopeless. It, you're utterly hopeless. You cannot change the circumstances. You're not going to stop somebody from loving theft. And so the problem that we see around us, the rampant theft, the larceny in the heart can only be solved in a gospel kind of way. What's that mean? You have to say fundamentally, look, the whole problem here in culture and society is that people have no problem taking from somebody something that does not belong to them. And the only way you're going to shake it is if they have a heart that is repentant towards God and a love and respect for their neighbor. It's not going to be solved any other way. So what's that mean? People have to be called to repentance and faith. They have to be called to repentance and faith. You have to point out what the problem is. It's not merely a political problem. It's a problem of sin. It's a problem of larceny in the hearts. And that's the issue. So the current political situation we're in, I admit it's difficult. And I want to say, I, everyone, we've heard, you've heard this a million times from this pulpit, and you've heard it on Apology or Radio. You've heard it. It's part of our culture. We talk about this sort of thing all the time. We know our origins and our history as a people. We know that our nation today, though we're in difficulty, our community is in difficulty, our society is in difficulty, we know that God actually did bestow some pretty significant and amazing blessings on us early on, right? We came in a pretty good way. Was it paradise? Absolutely not. They blew it in many ways. Was it a utopia? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Those Christians then, they were fallible human beings and they blew it in some ways too. I want to say we know where they blew it by looking at the Word of God and saying where they were off. But we have blessings now that we still actually benefit from that came from the Bible, that came from the law of God, and that came from our Christian forebears. That's where it came from. It's really amazing when you think about what God did with this place that we're at right now. It's crazy. He had Christians over in England that experienced a lot of difficulty. 
essentially the Puritan culture, they experienced a lot of difficulty. They experienced difficulty in their culture. They experienced difficulty in terms of religious persecution. They experienced difficulty in the system of justice that was over there. You had issues where the, the church over there had fallen off in many ways. The government had fallen off in many ways. They were no longer appealing to God's word as a standard of law and government. And so Christians left that oppression. They came over here and they stated it explicitly. You can see it while they were on the Mayflower. They're writing it down. They're saying, we're going to make a compact. We're going to say it right now. We're doing this to expand the gospel. We're doing this to expand the kingdom of Jesus. That's why we're coming over here. It's explicit. It was all about God. It was all about His glory. And when they came over, they blew it in many ways. You had instances where they did some sort of trial and error stuff, where like a little bit of socialism started to creep in early on in that community. As soon as they got off, a little bit of socialism started to creep in, and then they realized, we're not getting anything done, and society is crumbling. And then lo and behold, they look at the Bible, and they read a text where it says, if someone doesn't work, they don't eat. And what did they do? They say, oh, lo and behold, God's word has something to say here. Okay, everybody, we're going to obey God now. If you don't work personally, you're not going to eat. And all of a sudden, flourishing, flourishing, flourishing. And as the society started to grow and started to get bigger and expand now, now what happens? Now they need a justice system. They need a government in place and operational. And what did they do? They didn't say, let's hodgepodge it. Let's try to figure it out on our own. Let's see. What do you think about justice for this? What do you think about that? I don't know. What do you think? What do you think? What's she think? Let's figure it out. Let's make it up. They didn't do that. What'd they do? You can see it explicitly. When they created civil government, they would point directly to the Word of God. They would quote John Jay, our first Supreme Court justice. When you look at the legal codes, when you look at what they actually established as a means of case law for our nation, we still appeal to it today. It's the basis. What did he do? He quoted from the Bible. That was the foundation of our nation. They, they knew, they understood, they, they learned from the Bible and they learned from history. They said, this is what God's word says about these issues. This is how a nation is to be set up. This is our worldview. This is what we think about man. This is what we think about society, civil government, culture. This is what we think about God. And they formed everything surrounding that. We think about the Bill of Rights today. We say, how could anybody ever want to get rid of freedom of speech? How could anybody ever want to get rid of somebody's right to defend their family, to defend themselves against a tyrannical government? How could anybody want to get rid of, I mean, the, the warrantless searches and seizures? Do we want those sorts of things now? People are saying, well, we don't really need them anymore. We don't really need that. Do you know why the Christians actually put those things in? Uh, because they got it from the Bible. They got it from Moses' law. They got it from Hebrew culture. And do you know what? They also learned not from the scriptures only. They knew from their experience how things fell apart when you stopped looking to God's law. And they understood, you know what? There was a time where people were actually being uh, like gathered together in the streets and thrown into jail and put before courts. And they were treated as though they were guilty and they had to be proven innocent. They knew what that meant. They understood from their own experience, look, there are serious consequences to, a, to abandoning God's law in a culture. We need to look to God's law, and so they set it up. I mentioned at the start here the New England pulpit. Brothers and sisters, if you love today the rights and freedoms you have, the justice that's in place, as much as we've fallen off, you have to understand that the New England pulpit is responsible for the war for independence. People call it the Revolutionary War. If you would have said that to them, they would have been offended. They didn't believe they were fighting a revolution. They understood they were fighting for, for independence from a tyrannical and oppressive government who had broken covenant, listen, 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 with them and with God. They were charging, listen, them with sin, not simply some minor adjustments needed. They said, this is sin, it's against God's word, you've sinned against us and against God, and therefore we are justified in being independent, because you're sinning. You have issues that we talk about surrounding the Black Robe Regiment. Those are my homies. I love them. If you don't know about the Black Robe Regiment, thank God for them. Presbyterian ministers of the gospel, Baptists, 
that stood behind a pulpit just like this, and they wore their Genevan black robes to preach from. And when they were done preaching about God's law, and when they were done preaching about the gospel, and when they were done preaching about justice, they took off their black robes, they picked up a rifle, and they went to fight. Don't forget that over in England, they didn't call it the Revolutionary War. They didn't call it the War for Independence. They didn't do that. You know what they called it? They called it the Presbyterian Revolt. That's how England described our war with them. Did you learn that today in public schools? Probably not. But you need to understand, we need to understand that it is specifically the preaching from God's law that got our nation to where we're at today. Now again, let me state it so that everyone can understand. Am I saying it was a utopia? Absolutely not. Am I saying they got everything right? Absolutely not. But what they did get right, we know because we can look at the Bible and we can see it there. That's where we come from. That's our heritage. So I want to say, listen, thank God. Thank God for the men and the women early on in our nation that stood on the Word of God and the biblical worldview, and that's why we still experience the fruit of that justice today. And can I say one more thing? Listen, nobody's ever going to love these things. Nobody's ever going to love them if they don't love God first and they don't love His Word. Why do we live in a culture today where people would even think to try to fight against these rights? Why do we live in a culture today that thinks it's okay to take the property of another person just to take it? The only reason that people think this way is because we have abandoned covenant with God. We don't want Jesus to be Lord over us, and we won't look to His Word as the standard. And so when you don't have God's law as the standard, well, now, guess what? The standards are up for grabs. If you don't have a word from God, revelation from God that you stand on, then everybody's opinion is equal. Your voice is white noise with everybody else. And again, children, white noise you will never understand. You turned your TV on. That's all it was, okay? Now let me just say we have to start with the word of God as our foundation, amen? No matter where we're at as Christians, we have essential unity, in the midst of diversity around some essential things, here's the foundation. First and foremost, lay the foundation. If we don't have God's Word as the foundation, we don't have any claim to true knowledge. There is no basis, no fundamental uh, justification for knowledge or truth without God's Word. We talk about that a lot. We talk about apologetics a lot. We like to defend the faith at Apologia Church. That's the name of our church, Apologia Church, a reasoned defense. It, that counts for this discussion too. The Word of God has to be our standard. If we don't have Jesus, then we're on sinking sand. What's the text say? We were in it as a church. Matthew chapter 7, Jesus gives an example of two kinds of people. One is a fool and one is a what? A wise one. And there are two foundations. One is sand and one is what? A rock. And there are two destinations. One is desolation, and one actually weathers the storm. And Jesus says, people will hear his words. Some people will actually dig deep and build a foundation. And that foundation ultimately is him and his revelation. And the others won't dig deep. They will not build on his word, and they're on sinking sands. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. If you want to have knowledge and wisdom about something, anything, you have to start with reverence, submission, and awe before God. There is no knowledge without Jesus Christ. There is no wisdom without Jesus Christ. There is so-called knowledge. Think for a moment about the antithesis. What do we have? We have the Word of God that provides for us a foundation for knowledge, for truth, for beauty, for goodness, for dignity and value in human beings. We have the Word of God that provides for us things like this. Ready? Thou shalt not steal. A foundation, a word from God, an absolute unmovable truth that says it is absolutely immoral and wrong to steal from your neighbor. Now, if you don't start with Jesus Christ, what do you have? If you take the popular version in today's culture, what do you have? You and me? And I'm not exaggerating here. This is not misrepresentation. This is quotations. 
You and me are stardust. We're simply products of a star that exploded, died, so that you could be alive. We are simply the descendants of highly evolved societies of bacteria. We are African apes. There is no good, there is no evil, there is only blind and pitiless indifference, Richard Dawkins. There is no imminent morality, Dr. Will Provine. We could go on for days. We could go on with quotations from the secularists, atheists, and agnostics of our day who will tell us that there is no absolute standard of good, no justice ahead of any of us, which means the practical outworking of that, brothers and sisters, is this. There is no basis.